Hey, future respiratory therapist, respiratory coach back here with you. Been gone for a minute. I apologize. Um, some big things happening in my life. I had my new baby girl. Her name is Everly May. And she was born last Monday, seven pounds, three ounces. She's doing fantastic. Mama's doing fantastic. I know you're concerned about dad. He's doing fantastic. We're all good. But I'm back at you here. I got a video for you. I've had several requests come in, so I'm going to try to get them knocked out and get them sent over to you here real quick, okay? Um, so you'll see lots of videos coming here over uh, the next couple of days. And they're just here for you. If, you. if you don't see what you're looking for, or if I put a video out here that doesn't make sense, then I want you to message me. And I want you to say, hey, can you break that down in a different way? Can you break this down? Can you talk to me about this? I'm here to help you guys, okay? And my channel is developed and is growing in a direction to aid respiratory care students to have a better foundation of knowledge as they prepare to go out and work in the, in the workforce, okay? So it's your channel. You tell me what you want to see, I'm going to do it, okay? So I wanted to start off with that. I've missed you guys. Here's my next video. Now, while I was gone... I got a message asking me to talk about suctioning and break it down as simply as possible. Now, the first thing you need to understand is why would you suction somebody, okay? And the answer to that is pretty simple. Either breath sounds tell you that you hear coarse crackles and they have lots of secretions in their airways and you need to clear them. So you need to suction them. Maybe you have visible secretions in your artificial airway and you need to help them clear them, okay? Maybe your airway graphics, your flow volume loop is showing a sawtooth pattern and maybe that's an indication that you have excessive secretions that you need to help your patients clear. You need to understand as the respiratory therapist, it's your job to help your patients who are, who are either mechanically ventilated or maybe not mechanically ventilated. It's your job to be able to recognize when they need suctioning, okay? Now, when you go to suction somebody, there's four key points that you need to remember, okay? The first one on the board here is that you must hyperoxygenate this patient. Now, you're going to see that this is a skip that's uh, a step that's skipped a lot of the times, but this is extremely important, okay? Anytime you suction somebody, you can cause one of two things, more than two things, but the two primary things you can cause is hypoxemia, and you can cause atelectasis, okay? Hyperoxygenating your patient will not prevent atelectasis, but it will prevent acute hypoxemia associated with the suctioning. So always hyperoxygenate your patient prior to suctioning, even if they're on a trach collar. So what about your trach patients? They're not on a vent. When they're on a ventilator, you hit that button, it's simple, okay? When they're not on a ventilator, you have to take the steps to hyperoxygenate them. If they're on a trach collar, turn your large volume nebulizer up to 100%. If they're not, let's say it's a, a patient that you're gonna have to NT suction, okay? Then put them on an honor breather for, for, for two or three minutes prior to suctioning them, okay? To prevent acute hypoxemia from the suctioning event, okay? Now the second thing you wanna remember is your proper suction pressures. Now, I'll just be real honest with you. A lot of time in the clinic setting, you see this pressure maxed out, okay? That's clinical practice that you'll see. That's not textbook theory-based practice, and it's damn sure not board practice. So on your boards, you got to know your suction pressures because they're going to give you scenarios where your suction pressures are incorrect, okay? And you have to know what these suction pressures are, okay? Now, these changed just recently in the latest edition of Egan's. So, we've got to know this. Your adult suction pressure range is negative 120 to negative 150 or up to 150, okay? Your pediatric is up to 120, negative 120. And your neonates are negative up to negative 100, okay? So, adults, remember 120 to 150. Pediatrics, remember 100 minus 100 to negative 120, and for your neonates, negative 80 to negative 100. Those are the latest guidelines that are out there, okay? Now, after you have your suction pressure set at the appropriate number, you have to consider your catheter size, okay? Now, to do this, also in the latest Egan's edition, 
they've simplified it to where you basically take the size of your airway, you multiply it times two, and you go down to the next even French number. So let me give you an example. An airway of an 8.0, whether it's a trach or an endotracheal tube, the size is 8.0. You multiply that times two, that'll give you 16. Go down to the next even number, that's 14. That's the suction catheter you use. Let's talk about a, a, a 7.0 in the tracheal tube. 7.0, seven times two is 14. Down to the next even number would be a proper suction catheter would be a 12 French. Now this again, a lot of hospital settings only have 14 French and 10 French. They don't have 12 Frenches, okay? But for your board exams, you have got to know this calculation. You have got to know how to choose the proper catheter size. Okay, and the last thing on the board here, point number four, is the amount of time allowed to perform the suction technique, okay? And that time is 15 seconds. Now, 15 seconds doesn't sound like a lot of time, but if I was to just stare at the camera now for 15 seconds, let's do it, 15 seconds, here we go. Fifteen. You got it? That's a long time to suction somebody. So you think the number one mistake I see with students learning how to suction is that they go in and they come out. They go in and they come out. But that's not, that's not doing anything because what you have to understand is that while you're suctioning the patient, okay, they're going to be coughing. The cough mechanism brings the secretions up towards the carina. When the secretions come up to the carina, that's when the suction catheter grabs them, okay? The suction catheter is not like a magnet that goes in and finds the secretions and suctions them out. That's not the way it works. You have to stimulate a cough and then hold the suction catheter in that position just above the carina while the patient coughs. They will bring the secretions to the catheter and then you can remove them. If you go in and right out then the patient will be coughing after the suction catheter is withdrawn and you will not maximize the suctioning event, okay? So remember, hold it there for just a little bit, okay? You have 15 seconds, that's plenty of time. I just proved to you how long it is. It's agonizingly painful to look at somebody in the eyes for 15 seconds. Think about that when you're suctioning somebody. You have 15 seconds, get in, stimulate a cough, hold the catheter while they bring secretions up, suction them, and then come out, okay? So it's not a race. It's a technique to maximize the number of passes you have to make, okay? If you go in and out, you'll have to suction that patient seven, eight, or nine times. If you go in and hold, you'll probably only have to suction that patient once, maybe twice, depending on how many secretions they have, okay? So that's, there you have it, guys. That's suctioning broken down as simplistically as I can make it, okay? Know your indications. Know the four points that you have to remember. Hyperoxygenate, proper suction pressure, proper catheter size, and proper suctioning time. Okay? And then contraindication, not contraindications, but hazards of suctioning. Obviously, hypoxemia, atelectasis. If you ever see PVCs, premature ventricular contractions on your, on your, um, your heart monitor, then that's an indication of hypoxemia. Give the patient more oxygen and limit your suctioning time, okay? Suctioning broken down as simplistically as it can be. Hope you guys all had a great spring break. If you're on it now, I hope you're enjoying it, and I hope you guys are studying and learning a lot. Have a great day.